Before we get started, can you introduce yourself and, and sure. tell us what your background is in? And so why I'm uh, I'm Bob Metzger. Uh, I am a, a shareholder at a boutique litigation firm called Rogers Joseph O'Donnell. I divide my time between San Francisco, where I am this week, and Washington, where I was last week. Um, earlier in my career, I was an equity partner at uh, Kirkland and Ellis, where I spent uh, some number of years uh, defending. False Claims Act cases against aerospace and defense firms. Uh, I have been a consultant of the MITRE Corporation since uh, 2017, done a variety of projects for the Department of Defense. Um, now I have one for Homeland Security, another one involving uh, crypto crimes and digital assets. Um, I've been uh, an advisor to uh, many companies, some very large, some middle-sized, and some small on a, a wide variety of cyber and supply chain uh, subjects. And I have advised uh, companies not uh, just on contractual compliance with the uh, cyber obligations, but on situations where there could be investigations or potentially an action brought by a whistleblower um, or the government under the False Claims Act case. Okay. Under the False Claims Act. Yeah, so let's talk about the False Claims Act. What is the False Claims Act and how does it relate to the defense industrial base and cybersecurity? So the False Claims Act has been around uh, since about the time of the Civil War. And the basic in intention of the False Claims Act is to uh, enable the government to punish people who overcharge the government or make false claims about their products. Um, in recent years, it's proven to be a very powerful weapon against uh, misdeeds by government contractors. I think in 2021, there was uh, $5.6 billion uh, recovered by DOJ or by whistleblowers who are you know, acting uh, in the government's name. Uh, but 5 billion of that, or about 89% um, was recovered against the healthcare industry. And what's notable is that in October of 2021, as you know well, Leslie, um, Deputy AG Lisa Monaco announced uh, this new civil cyber fraud initiative. And what she said is that the Department of Justice is going to use the tools available to it under the False Claims Act uh, to um, improve uh, the behavior, the conduct of uh, companies and to uh, bring uh, actions against and potentially recover uh, damages from uh, companies that uh, failed to fulfill their uh, cyber obligations. Now, you had mentioned at the very outset something that's incredibly important, and that is this uh, idea of enforcement. And I think you know and probably agree with me that enforcement has been something of a challenge, despite all of the regulations and requirements that impose cyber obligations on companies. You know, we don't hear a lot of uh, disputes going to a board of contract appeals over whether uh, compliance was adequate or not. And there was only a handful of bid protests that even raised the sufficiency of the cyber measures of a particular contractor. And you know, CMMC is supposed to bring to us um, an assessment regime where, where we will have trained uh, third-party assessors who will actually go and look at and validate, certify, or fail to certify the actual security accomplishments of defense contractors. But that regime is not yet in place. And so we have to see this DOJ civil cyber fraud initiative in the context where the threat of adversary or criminal exfiltration or attack upon defense contractors is great. Vulnerabilities are many and increasing. The impacts of successful cyber or ransomware attacks are severe. The national government has very powerful reasons to want companies to do a better job to protect themselves. And the Civil Cyber Fraud Initiative is part of their toolkit. I think we will see it um, used, perhaps not as much as some expect because of the complexity of these cases, but we will see it used as another way to emphasize to the defense industrial base that they really do have to provide uh, adequate security against uh, threats using the cyber standards that are imposed by contracts. And we'll also see, I think, um, DOJ looking for instances where companies uh, were aware of a cyber breach, uh, where that breach was material and would affect government interest, 
and yet uh, where the companies uh, failed to fulfill their contractual obligation to give timely notice to DOD of the breach. So you brought up a, a lot of things that I want to kind of unpack each one, right? Because um, the way that our court system works, right, is through case law. The, the government establishes a standard and then, you know, something is brought to uh, to the court system and uh, judges define it or they they add questions or they, you know, talk about it in depth. So this False Claims Act case that settled earlier this year, um, it was the first False Claims Act case that was brought um, in, brought to federal court. Um, if I'm not mistaken, um, it ended up settling. So we didn't get a whole lot of um, good decisions or find out too much. But there were some legal questions that were posed by the judge in this case mm -hmm. that are still open. And I wanted to kind of pick your brain about how you. Um, sure. You well, let me jump in again, sure. not to not to interrupt, but I want to set a little foundation. You know, in theory, um, if you lose a False Claims Act case, the government can recover uh, three times its damages. And that can be a lot if the government can prove damages. Uh, you know, in theory, Actual you damages. can recover. Sorry. Do they have to prove actual damages? Because uh, well, was they, they can case. recover they can recover uh, fines or forfeitures. I think the amount of the penalties that they can recover have gone up just recently to into a range of twelve thousand five hundred and thirty seven dollars to twenty five thousand seventy six. And in instances where they can't prove actual damages, but a company has submitted hundreds or thousands of invoices, if it is found that they falsely made an implied representation of cyber compliance. Well, if you take, you know, 500 invoices and multiply them by $25,076 per invoice as the uh, fines, you know, you can get to pretty big numbers. But when we think about, you know, where cases will be brought by justice or where whistleblowers will find private counsel to pursue uh, actions under the False Claims Act, um, the damages do matter. You know, in some of the Medicare or healthcare fraud cases, it's pretty easy to see, you know, the damages if um, a pharmaceutical should cost $3 and you charge $5 for it, and then there are 100,000 of them sold. And, you know, the private lawyers who can assist whistleblowers, um, they're going to be very interested in the amount of potentially provable damages or recoverable fines, because these cases are uh, long to bring and difficult to win and difficult to defend. And by the same token, you know, the Justice Department says, you know, many powerful things about this new civil cyber fraud initiative. And I have no doubt that they mean them, but there is not a huge army of DOJ lawyers who are trained and specialized in the cyber area. And as most of the listeners know, cyber is not the clearest area for what is, isn't, or isn't compliant, is sufficient or isn't, and in areas where you know the, the standard of care or the measure of adequacy are debatable, it can be pretty hard to show the necessary scienter or culpable state of mind that is required for there to be liability under the act. And so you are right to focus upon that Marcus, Marcus case. And I've been watching it since it was unsealed in 2018. This is Marcus v. Aerojet. And it is highly instructive. One of the things I, I was going to mention when I took the liberty of, of interrupting is that the, the Marcus case was originally brought in October 20, on October 29 of 2015. And the actual conduct that Marcus was complaining about while he was an Aerojet employee you know, culminated, I think, in his being fired after making some internal whistleblower complaints in 2014. Well, if we just measure the time period from when uh, the case was filed to the, when the case came out from under seal, I think that was three years. But between the time of filing the case and the time that the settlement was announced in April 2022, we had six and a half years and a gigantic amount of effort that was expended by Whistleblower Council and, of course, by Kirkland and Ellis, which happened to be leading the defense for Aerojet. While they you know, what we saw, as you know, was um, a February 2022 decision by the court on motions for summary judgment, Kirkland and Ellis raised, you know, many uh, arguments that there was nothing that need be decided by the jury, and that most of the allegations, perhaps all of them, could be decided as a matter of law, so that would never go to trial. Well, for the most part, they lost that motion in a published decision that's quite significant. 
And yet, you know, they proceeded to complete trial preparation. It was only on the second day of trial, just one day after the jury was impaneled, that the case settled. And the case settled for a payment of $9 million to the whistleblower. He was paid, I think, separately for um, his wrongful termination claims. And I'm forgetting how his attorney's fees were paid. Well, they may have been part of his of the settlement. Of that $9 million, um, seems like a pretty big number. Um, he, the whistleblower, only got uh, 29% of that, uh, which is a little bit short of the maximum. And so, you know, if we were to go way up to 25 or 50,000 feet, while there is plenty of reasons uh, to, to learn from and be wary of a False Claims Act allegation, no one should think that the path between the allegation and recovery is short or sure. But by the same token, companies uh, who are paying attention should appreciate that the cost to defend a False Claims Act uh, proceeding, even where it's not being run by the Justice Department, as was the case in Marcus, you know, the cost to defend it is enormous and the exposure is very large, moving towards gigantic. And I know I'm talking a little bit too long, but I'll just sort of add one thought, you know, someone who's actually defended these cases. Um, you know, there's much to admire in the jury system, but ask yourself uh, whether if you are a defense contractor, um, you are comfortable having uh, a jury decide whether or not you satisfied a cyber requirement, whether or not your disclosures of a cyber breach were complete, whether or not the government would have contracted differently if they had known your true cyber accomplishments or deficits. I mean, there is frankly something of a lottery aspect here. While you know, the, the defense can have you know, many good arguments that juries will understand, you know, typically, the plaintiff is going to start by saying, you promised to do X, Y, Z. You didn't. You knew you had problems. You didn't disclose them. And the government was misled. You know, as someone who you know, does tend to represent the defense side or only represents the defense side, you know, I, don't, I don't feel you know, very comfortable uh, to be in a situation where these kinds of very difficult, complex questions are going to a jury because the outcome could have relatively little to do with the evidence or the law. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. Um, in this case, the air jet situation, the facts were not in dispute. So in some cases, I can see there being a dispute. Uh, you know, we think we're compliant. Some other assessor says we're not. For example, in CMMC, if somebody fails CMMC, there's a dispute of facts, right? Of we've done this or no, we haven't. But in this case, the facts themselves are not in dispute. Um, but the judge says um, that it's not, it was not for him to decide um, as right. a matter of law uh, for the request for summary judgment um, that adequate security. So there was this question about adequate security because DFAR 7012 says you have to be compliant with NIST 800 and provide adequate security. So there was no dispute about their lack of full compliance with 171. Like that was never a question. The DOD was aware. <laughs> The company admits that they, you know, told DOD and everybody knew that. But what they, what, what, a, what the question that arose was, um, was the company's knowledge of their own breaches that they had paid for for a third party to come in and do these assessments? The companies, you know, these third parties found the breaches. The company chose not to fix the vulnerabilities. Um, I'm not entirely sure if any DOD information was um, exfiltrated as part of that breach. It wasn't really discussed in the in the opinion. Um, but let's just say for, for discussion purposes, no DOD information left the company's network, and it was just company information or you know, proprietary information, but not related to the government. Because if it was DOD information, yes, they were required to report that as per DFAR 7012. But if it's not DOD information, should they have been responsible for reporting that to the well, government? I mean, this raises many good questions. Um, some of us that are focusing on CMMC tend to see only the front end of the 7012 clause, the one that says that you have to have adequate security and which uh, later says that adequate security includes uh, meeting the 110 requirements of NIST special publication 800-171. But the back end of the 7012 clause actually is equally important. And it says that you have to report cyber events within 72 hours of uh, disclosure. And from the government standpoint, it's extremely important because where there is uh, exfiltration of information, evidence of a cyber breach, 
the government needs to know, and for a lot of reasons, the principal reason has been that they want to conduct an impact analysis so that they understand the extent to which our present capabilities now have become known to potential adversaries, uh, are potentially compromised or could be replicated. This should not be forgotten. That's why I said at the start that I think one of the important purposes D DOJ will pursue is trying to you know, find a case where there was insufficient, uh, no, insufficient or failure to notify. But you, know, you mentioned adequate security. This is a term that's also often uh, overlooked. You know, those of us looking at 712, we're all thinking about how to show compliance with those 110 requirements. But, you know, that's not the only thing that you have to do under the clause. You know, it says that you have to provide um, adequate security, and it proceeds to say that you have to implement these NIST controls at a minimum, which suggests that if you knew from your circumstances that the minimum controls were not enough, that you have to do more. And here, the judge's decision in February of 22 on this aspect of the Marcus case was quite important. The judge says that a reasonable trier, in fact, could find that the government agencies with whom Aerojet uh, was contracting would not see Aerojet as providing adequate security in light of the audit findings. And those audits uh, included essentially a third party review and the third party raised some alarms. I think there was also a penetration test, which also raised alarms. And so the notion is, hypothetically, that a jury could say, gee, you had this third party report, you had bad results from pen test, you knew that there were at least four instances where significant volumes of data were exfiltrated. And if all of those things happen, leaving aside notification of the event, you weren't doing a good enough job to satisfy that continuing contractual obligation to provide adequate security. And, you know, I'm sure you've been in law school long enough, Leslie, or have heard this before, that bad facts tend to lead to bad outcomes. And, you know, this was a case where, you know, if you read the allegations of the whistleblower, there were a lot of bad facts. And that's why Kirkland, understandably, made a huge emphasis on trying to use potential arguments, legal arguments, to narrow the case and then to try to resolve it without going to the, a trial. And what's significant, you know, the case isn't really precedent on the outcome. And it's just the opinion of one district, George, district judge in you know, one place. But the fact that most of these legal defenses, hoping to avoid a jury trial, did not succeed. You know, certainly will um, give some incentive to DOJ to pursue more cases, and it will increase the incentive for private whistleblowers to find counsel who will represent them. But it's not going to be a flood. These cases are too hard to bring, too hard to win, and very expensive in the attempt and in the defense. So I have two questions. First one is about whistleblowers. Um, are they protected by law if they come forward? Um, are like, what can a whistleblower expect? It's not that I'm encouraging people to become whistleblowers, um, you know, for for bad reason or for no reason. But you know, if somebody is really aware of something in their company and they, uh, in you know, mm -hmm. good faith, feel like they need to become a whistleblower, what can they expect to happen, um, or how can they be protected by? The well, I'll give you the formal and less formal answer. I mean, formally, whistleblowers are protected. And the False Claims Act, as I recall, includes um, uh, obligations not to take uh, retaliatory actions against whistleblowers. And typically, a whistleblower will uh, make allegations of wrongful uh, retaliation or wrongful termination. And if you have a successful whistleblower claim, you're likely to have a successful retaliation claim. Um, you know, I see whistleblowers, um, you know, ideally as serving a very valuable public purpose because there is misconduct that occurs in the defense industry and among other federal contractors. And it's important for whistleblowers to, to bring those issues to public attention so that the interest of the public in getting value for what it pays for goods and services is protected. It's a very difficult thing to do because in practical terms, all too often uh, a whistleblower may keep her or his job, but they'll find that their assignments change. There may be once was a complaint that is filed initially under seal. There could be a couple of years of investigation where nobody knows about it, but eventually the complaint will come out from under seal. 
the public will know about it. There may be an accompanying investigation by uh, criminal or civil investigative units or the FBI. And so it can be kind of a tough road for the whistleblower to be ostracized by the community of people that she or he uh, works with. Um, but uh, especially in the area of cyber, whistleblowers are considered um, essential by the Department of Defense. This is a statement that was made by Brian Boynton of DOD, DOJ rather, on October 12th. Whistleblowers with inside information have been critical to identifying and pursuing new and evolving fraud schemes that might otherwise remain undetected. They also bring considerable technical expertise to complex investigations. You and I know from experience just how complicated and uncertain many areas of cyber practice and compliance are. Well, you know, this is not stuff that DOJ lawyers have been studying perhaps as much as we have. And so for DOJ or a private whistleblower lawyer to have a good chance at succeeding, they need the benefit of the technical expertise and the inside information of a whistleblower. And typically, a whistleblower has some access to inside information. Information can mean evidence, whether it's you know electronic or in physical form. And evidence is just indispensable because you know for all that you can remember, recall, or accuse someone, you know if all you have is the evidence of what's in your head, well, you don't have a very good case. But if you have that evidence plus you know records that you have somehow proper you know perhaps improperly obtained you know, through your, from your employer, well, I mean, that gives something more for DOJ or whistleblower counsel to act upon and could have decisive effect if the evidence is admitted at trial and if the case goes that far. So, and this brings kind of back to my second question or ties in nicely. Um, so back to the question of adequate security. Um, is it like, for example, some of these large primes have multiple environments around the world, right? In different offices, different locations, different states, different countries. Um, are they required to provide adequate security for their company, for the entire company, or is it just the environments where the, the government information may reside? Um, are they all this, you know, are they all the same? You know, it's it's very hard for compliance, um, you know, as a consultant uh, in working in the commercial space to help even identify network boundaries, right? Because they're right. so technical and so intermingled. Um, do you see that that the courts being able to sift through all of that technical? Well, I, I think that's a, a great question. And it, it's a question that besets, you know, the whole of the CMMC initiative. I mean, it's one thing to ask a company with a single information system to do a self-assessment and submit a score of its uh, present cyber uh, satisfaction as they are obliged to, to the government's SPRS system. But if you're a very large company, you might have dozens of cage codes indicating separate operations. You could have many dozens of projects. And you know, each cage code, each project, each information system, in a sense, is you know, part of and similar to others within um, a company, but they can operate um, with some independence. Do you really have to assess every information system in a $10 billion contractor that employs 70,000 people and has 50 gauge codes? It's not going to happen, and it hasn't happened so far. So I, I think from the False Claims Act perspective, it's going to be a much uh, narrower focus. It's going to be more um, transactional or event-driven. Uh, you know, is it possible that somebody could say that an entire enterprise, uh, you know, defrauded the government by poor cyber? It's possible, but you're going to have a hell of a time proving it. Whereas if, uh, like the relator Brian Marcus, I mean, if you're in a situation where you're working with a company and you're part of events and you participate in looking at security and you know which systems are are in question or where information was taken, well, you know, that's going to be the way these cases proceed. No, Brian was actually accusing the whole of Aerojet of having a bad system. He was uniquely in a position to do that because I think he had been the chief information security officer or close. He was like of that compliance here. or something. He was so. senior director of cybersecurity compliance and controls. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think if, if I were counseling uh, whistleblowers, which I generally don't, um, I would say that you, you know, don't want to make a complaint against the whole of the company. You want to focus on a particular contract or contracts on a project in a program. 
you know, where there's evidence that the, there is not just failure to perform cyber requirements, but knowing failure to perform, meaning that it was done with willful disregard for obligations, um, with uh, an intent to defraud, with a reckless neglect of requirements. So you have to have that state of mind. You have to have evidence that in fact uh, shows that there, there was a failure to comply. And I think you have to have impact because these cases are just too hard to bring on a, a complaint about a theoretical problem that isn't attached to any consequence. Um, maybe a whistleblower can start such a complaint but you know, it's a business decision for private whistleblower councils to decide whether to take these cases. They don't get paid anything, if at all, until they settle successfully or win after trial. And it's in a sense, it's a business decision for DOJ as well, because they only have so many lawyers who can pursue only so many of these cases. And without impact, they're less likely to pursue it. And it's not just impact, Leslie, it's impact to the government. Now let's think about the Marcus case where it was alleged that there were four breaches with large volumes of information presumably related to rocket propulsion. Well, you'd think there's impact there and there is strong evidence that there was complaints by a key guy on security about improper security. And yet the Department of Justice did not intervene and did not take over control of that case. That case was run by the whistleblower's private counsel from beginning to end. And it was only, I guess, it was only two weeks after the October 6th announcement of the Civil Cyber Fraud Initiative that suddenly, you know, the Department of Justice uh, you know, filed a statement of interest in the case. This is in 2022. And yeah, sorry, it was in October 20th, 2021, my mistake. So this is five years after the case was filed. DOJ says, oh, we're interested in this two weeks after the initiative is announced. And they say, actually, we do support, you know, the theories of uh, the whistleblower and materiality. Well, I mean, I think that that submission was probably influential to the court. Don't know that. But it does, you know, emphasize this point. It's got to be a big case. It's got to have bad facts. It's got to be real damage. And you don't want to get into arguments, you know, as to whether my compliance was better than your compliance, but either might be sufficient. And often on many of these individual 110 NIST requirements, they're expressed in just a single sentence. But it's been said by a government official, you know, John Ellis, that you might be able to satisfy it, you know, with a, a truck or a Cadillac. I'm paraphrasing it. <laughs> and so, you know, if I decide to have a truck and you decide I should have a Cadillac, going to be awfully tough to show that there is fraudulent intent and a material misrepresentation and injury to the government because I got a truck. I mean, it's still legal to drive and all the Cadillac might be a different ride. It's just not fraudulent to drive the truck. No, that's absolutely right. And I want to ask like one more quick question before I let you go. Um, let's flip the script and how would you counsel defense contractors, right? Because I of, do counsel defense contractors. I, I say, don't take, don't I take any chances. Yeah. Do, you know, Pay attention to your people. If there is um, internal dissent or dispute about the adequacy of cyber, um, elevate it to senior uh, compliance, cyber, and other management. Involve uh, inside counsel. Never dismiss um, out of hand a an internal concern about cyber compliance. I also emphasize the importance of you know of a process where you have some questions or concerns. You need to have an elaborate, fair, and well documented process. So. You consider the arguments, and when you reach a decision, you want to um, try to. In, you certainly want to inform the complaining employee about the decision you've made, and you also want to have very, very good documentation of what, how you assess the uh, allegation, uh, what you did, and to document and explain your reasoning. Um, I often, if not always, would suggest that these kinds of initiatives should be undertaken at the direction of outside counsel so that the attorney client privilege and the work product immunity can be uh, retained. You know, if you're doing an internal investigation just because it's the right thing to do and it doesn't go well and it hasn't been done by counsel, well, then it's just discoverable or, you know, in civil litigation or can be, you'd have to produce it if you were subpoenaed. That may not help you. Um, it's crucial for companies not to let this happen to them, even though it was 
you know, arguably a painful, you know, even though the Marcus case said that, uh, yeah, he got he got a significant amount of money, took him, you know, seven years to get there. Um, my advice to companies is that you have a lot better ways to spend your money than on outside counsel, outside forensics, outside accountants, and all of the other, all the expense and all the disruption of defending a serious FCA case. So in that sense, I take very seriously DOJ's civil cyber fraud initiative. I think they are looking for good cases. They may only find a few, but I don't want my clients to be among those who are selected by DOJ to pursue an FCA case. Right. So I like one more question. Can you clarify, um, mostly for my own personal curiosity, um, when attorney-client privilege applies and when it doesn't? So you said make sure you have um, a third-party counsel, not in-house. Does in-house counsel not provide? Well, uh, so my, 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 if in-house counsel, it depends. I mean, if in-house counsel is established and their role is purely one of compliance and they're not involved in business advice, then I then I think there's a pretty good argument that there is uh, you know sufficient separation such that the in-house counsel is doing you know legal advice in relation to a potential dispute. If you have an in-house counsel is always advising on how to conduct the business, and then that in-house counsel does the investigation of a FCA allegation, you know it, the argument's going to be that the privilege doesn't apply because the work of the lawyer wasn't being a lawyer. It was to support the business. Now, this is actually, it's a great question, and it's actually a sophisticated area, and I'm giving it too, too simple a view. In real life, I, when I talk to clients about these matters, they often do a sizable amount of the work internally mm -hmm. uh, because outside counsel are expensive. But there can be a point of inflection where you see that where you you know, the where you go further is best done, you know, by outside counsel. In fact, you know, if I were to recreate history in, in Aerojet, uh, when they started their internal inquiries after Marcus made his initial complaints in 2014 or so, there might have been a point where they saw that some evidence was coming around that was really bad. And, you know, if you continue to investigate that internally for three years without outside counsel, well, all, all everything that you you have and all the reports that you generate, those things are gonna become evidence as I think they did in, in Marcus um, against the defendant. So there can be times, despite the expense and the annoyance of outside counsel, that the smart move is to hire outside counsel early. Not every time, but sometimes. No, I appreciate that. It's definitely, it was probably cheaper than $9 million that they paid. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I having defended False Claims Act cases as a Kirkland litigation partner, I, I have great respect for the obstinacy, tenacity, ingenuity, persistence of that firm as an example of a fine litigation firm. They can make any hard case um, hard to win or to lose, but, you know, the client ultimately is paying for it. And the better choice always is not to let these things happen so that you don't have to engage uh, firms like Kirkland or others, you know, who specialize in this kind of work. No, absolutely. Um, very sound advice. So thank you so much for joining me for this um, conversation um, about enforcement. So yeah, this has been thank fun. Thank you. My privilege. <laughs> Thanks for watching Defense TechCast, your deep dive into CMMC, CUI, and all of the cybersecurity hot topics affecting the defense space today. Brought to you by clearancejobs.com and with host Leslie Weinstein, a cyber expert and U.S. Army major. Subscribe to this page to be sure you can catch the next episode.